Let's get going. First things first, for, I hope the sorting assignment's going all right. Um, I will be in and out of the lab tonight uh, because I've got a bunch of advising meetings to do this evening, but I should be in, in and out of the lab and uh, grab me if you do have any specific questions. Um, Piazza's been kind of had a few. I think there have been fewer Piazza questions this time than, than the last assignments, which is good. It means this assignment's probably a little more manageable, maybe, but also you guys are better because you just continually get better in this class, which is awesome. Um, uh, Nelly actually came up to me and said, uh, hey, I ran out of disk space. My Eclipse is deleting my stuff, et cetera, et cetera. If you did the lab this week and didn't save your output files to the slash TMP folder, you might end up with tremendously huge uh, files in your folder. And you, want, and you we might run out of disk space, which is not what we want to do. So let's see if I have a lab aid. I do. Take a look at some of these file sizes. These are actually tiny. This one's jumbo flipped is only 560 kilobytes. But if you did jumbo, if you did jumbo times 10, that would be, if it's double in both directions, it would be, uh, let's see, instead it would be basically four times bigger, right? So it would be, uh, it would be like two and a half megabytes, and it would be huge. So what you do is just do rm, go into your lab 8 folder, rm star dot, oops, rm star dot, PPM, and that will remove them for you. Okay, and then you should do that. If you want to check how much disk space you have, type quota, and it will tell you some details. If there's a star next to the top one here, then that means you're over, and you won't be able to save anything, and that'll be bad. So I don't want you guys losing stuff. So remove your PPM files. Okay, do you guys like the lab this week? Is it all right? Got to see images and stuff, kind of fun. Uh, when you get to Comp 40, you'll do some more stuff with PPM. So those of you who are taking Comp 40 will get some practice in that. All right. Any other questions before we get going? All right. We're going to finish up what we started with yesterday on hashing and then continue with more hashing uh, for the rest of the period here. And by the end of today, you should know a lot about hash tables, but you haven't really practiced them. You don't really practice hash tables until you try to build one yourself. And the next assignment, which is actually going to, I guess it will probably be out tomorrow, uh, is you could, if you wanted to, create a, uh, a hash table for that assignment. You do not have to, and that would be a, like well above and beyond what you want, but you could do it, and it might be an interesting, uh, interesting exercise. Let's remind ourselves. Hashing is what? Taking a function, applying it to some data, the key, getting a number out of it, and then putting that number into some array where you can then find it again. And normally what we do is we do a modulus on the number of buckets so that we can fit everything in those buckets. Okay? Apply a function to a number or, or some object, get a number out, mod, mod that number by the number of buckets we have in our array, and then that's where we're going to place the data, both the key and the value we place in that location. Okay, that's hashing. Now, we finished the other day, we kind of mentioned this thing called a, a load factor. Remember that we, when we have collisions, we can end up having to make linked lists, which will uh, be able to still store stuff in our hash table. But if we, uh, if we have lots of linked lists, we'll end up with really bad performance. And we love hash tables because they're good performance. So we need to have this load factor, which keeps the uh, it keeps the number, the, the overall uh, hash table big enough for the amount of things we want to put into it. Okay? Lowercase n is the number of things we're going to store. Uppercase n is the number of buckets we're going to have, the, array, the size of our array. If you divide those two numbers, you get a ratio. And we want that ratio to be relatively small. Okay? We want the ratio to be less than 1, certainly. Generally, depending on the language you're using or, or the way you've built your hash table, you want the load factor to be roughly between 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. If you, can keep the ha the, if you can keep the load factor to about that range, then you will have a good, a good hash table. If the load factor is low, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, the hash code function is good. Remember, we had some terrible hash code functions like your birthday uh, decade, because all you guys happen to be born in the 90s, right? So you all bunched up over here. That's a bad hash function. But if you have a good hash function, you don't have duplicate keys. In other words, there's no, none of this duplicate key business. 
Not, we're not talking about collisions, we're just saying the same key, trying to put it in the hash table twice. Then you will get this constant behavior, which is exactly what we want in a hash table. OK, so that's the bottom line with, with hash tables. We can change the ratio by doing a couple things. If we add more elements, the, the ratio will go down. If we make the number of buckets bigger, like change the size of our array, the, the, uh, the actual load factor will go down. Okay, and that's, uh, that's one thing we're going to have to consider in a little bit. Okay, so we'll get there. All right. If the load factor gets big, then you're going to run into linear behavior. And we do not like that, especially when we're expecting our hash table to be nice and fast. Okay, so keep your load factors low, and things will be good. Okay, another little review from yesterday. Hash codes must be deterministic. We already talked about that. Okay, you've got to do this, get the same value out every time. Not that hard to do. They should be fast and they should be distributed. You don't want to bunch people up next to the nine. You want to spread them out over all the different buckets. Okay, but I have a question for you. This is going to take a little bit of thinking. Let's say that we have uh, an ideal hash. In other words, this hash function is random. In other words, it places, takes your values and somehow applies a random function to it so that the distribution, distribution is perfect. It's perfectly random. Okay, does that make sense that that would be a good hash function? A perfectly random distribution. So no matter like, what your input is, it will randomly be put in some bucket. Okay, That's, that would be a perfect hash function, an ideal hash. Okay, is an ideal hash collision free? Which means, remember what collision free means. If you take two numbers and apply the hash function to both those numbers, is there a possibility that they both go into the same bucket? So is it collision free? Are random numbers ever collision free? In other words, if I start spouting off random numbers between 1 and 10, 6, 4, 3. Humans, by the way, are terrible at coming up with random numbers. Our brains just aren't very good at it. But let's say I did that. Would I ever duplicate? Yeah, in fact, I could say there's a good XKCD comic that has this guy, or is it, maybe it's a Dilbert comic. I think it's a Dilbert comic. It's basically a guy doing, like, trying to say random numbers, and he just goes, four, 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 four. And somebody else says, well, that could be random, right? I mean, it could be. Who knows? Like a bunch of fours in a row could be random. So no, an ideal hash function is not collision free. But what if we have tons and tons of buckets, OK? Are we going to be able to? do a collision-free hash, hashing more or less, right? The odds are going to be really small. Here's what I want you to think about. What if we had 2,500 keys? In other words, 2,500 things we're going to hash. 2,500. That's it. OK, it sounds like a lot, but that's it. 2,500 things. And you make an array that's a million buckets wide, OK? What do you think? the probability of having a collision is across those 2,500 keys. Talk to your neighbor about that. Okay? Talk to your neighbor about that. Say, just kind of just make a guess. In other words, you put all 2,500 in there, what's the idea you're going to get a collision? What do you guys think about this? Who has an idea? What do you think the probability of getting a collision is 2,500 in a million buckets? Guesses? Yeah, Ben. So OK, what do, what do you think? <laughs> Percentage. This is not graded. OK, 4% or 0.4%. Somebody else. Yeah. Okay, 
pause for one second. Nobody else give up how to find it if you think. But if you think, just guess for right now, just guess. What are your guess? What are you, what's your guess anyway? Um, you need to the Don't tell me how. Don't tell me how. Just guess. Oh, as in the yeah. What do you think? Like point, zero. point zero something. OK. A quarter. a quarter of a percent? OK. And remember, we're putting all 2,500 in, and then one, and we have a collision or not. That's the, that's the guess. Yeah. 60%. Hmm, OK. I agree. Unexpectedly high. OK. Now, what do you think about how to do it, Katya? Um, could you calculate the percentage? Of, of, <laughs> no, math. Oh, no, math. No, no, no. Calculate the probability of each individual occurrence and then like, overlapping and then figuring out. Yeah, yeah. Has anybody ever heard of the birthday problem in a math class? The birthday problem is the one where you say, hey, we have 25 people in the room. What's the probability of having an overlapping birthday? Right? If 2,500 keys are hashed in a million buckets, even with a perfectly uniform distribution, there is a 95% chance of two of the keys mad being hashed to the same spot. Not 0.04, not 0.4, not 4%. 95% of the time. Now, you guys won't believe me, right? You're like, ah, baloney. Well, I actually wrote a little program. Of course I did. <laughs> right? I wrote a little program to do this. All right? It is called, let's see, it's called collisiontest.py. And all it does is it does this. It says, here's a million buckets, and it's going to put them in 10 times. It's going to do it 100 times, and it's going to give you the percentage of times there was one collision. Right? And this is just going to go on forever. It's gonna, so basically, it's doing 100 times. It's saying 2,500 buckets into a million, and then give me the average percentage. Look at that. Right? Pretty high, OK? I'll post this on the, on the website if you want to look at the program. It's, it's like really simple. But the idea is that, yeah, your intuition for these kind of problems is definitely uh, off if you're thinking, oh, it's going to be really low. And it's because you think 2,500 into a million, that's a lot. But the, if you go and do the kind of the birthday problem on this, it, it ends up being if there's, I think the birthday problem is if there's like 23 people in a room, you've got a 50% chance of having two people having the same birthday, like same day of the year, not in all, you know, not the same year, but same day of the year. So it's, there's, there's intuition things because the, because the math kind of works out to, to do that. So what that means, and the reason I, I bring this up is not to show you that intuition is bad, although that's a good lesson to learn, <laughs> incidentally. But what it means is that you can never write a hash table and say, ah, I'm, not, I'm just going to make so many buckets that I won't get collisions. I don't need to worry about collisions. You do need to worry about collisions. Okay? They will happen even with a perfect, uh, an ideal hash table. Not a perfect ha or hash function. Perfect hash functions are slightly different. The, uh, the hash function we used with the two letter words, that was a perfect hash function because we were able to map all two letter words to our 676 bucket array. Okay? So that was a perfect hash function. But in this case, if you're talking about having 2,500 keys that don't, that, that don't get mapped to distinctly to a bucket, right? they, could just, they could go to randomly to any bucket, then you're going to have to deal with collisions. Okay? Word to the wise, you have to deal with collisions. Okay? The compression function. That's the part that's going to actually it's going to actually move the buckets in or move the keys into the actual uh, individual buckets. Bad compression functions are the ones that don't distribute things well. Okay? Bad compression functions are, for instance, if you do a hash code on the integer, well, in that case, what if you if you if you end up um, doing that, well, then you end up with Issues like this. If you have all your keys happen to be divisible by 4, and you do this, this hash table, guess what? Your hash code is also divisible by 4. You will not use up 3 fourths of the buckets, which would be a bad hash function. Remember, we want to distribute it through all of the buckets. You don't want one bucket to never get used. That would be silly. right? You don't want that. How do you fix these things? You can actually make the number of buckets prime. What's nice about what's interesting about prime numbers is that if you do modulus with a prime number, you end up getting a very good spread because remember, prime numbers are not like divisible by anything but themselves and zero. So you're always going to get some kind of random spread in there. Okay, so making the number of buckets prime is good. It's not necessarily the best because then you've got like 
how many buckets do I have? Oh, 17 or whatever, right? Which is a weird number of buckets, right? You don't necessarily want weird number of buckets, but this this one way to do it. Other ways to do it are to say, fine, do a modulus on some prime number, and then do another modulus on the number of buckets, right? So scramble everything and then apply the uh, the actual bucket modulus. Okay, so this would be a good hash function. What are you doing? You're actually saying, okay, a and b are positive integers. P is some large prime that's bigger than the number of buckets you have. And if you apply this hash function and you say whatever the hash Again, I should not, yeah, well, this probably shouldn't say the hash code. This would probably be, OK, yeah, once you've hashed it, this will be all right. You, make, you do your hash code. You do A times hash code plus B, mod, mod it by this giant prime number, scrambling everything up, and then by, mod it by the number of buckets. You will get a nice even distribution. OK, so this is a pretty good uh, mod function. Then you don't need to worry about your buckets being a prime number of buckets. So that works out OK. All right? OK. How about, a, how about a mod function for strings? Because sometimes you have to, you have to uh, use key, your keys for, as strings. Okay? So one way to do this is to do this. You could say uh, big prime number, and then go through all the letters in your string and apply the same sort of business here that we had before. In other words, do some number, that, like the ASCII numbers, 0 through 127, which are basically what all your characters are in your string. Uh, multiply that by the hash value, add the, the value of the, uh, of the actual uh, string letter, of the letter, and then mod it by that giant prime number, and that will, sp that will spread things ar around. And then you're going to want to mod it to the number of buckets, too. Okay? You will do a lab next week on hashing. So um, if some of this is like, what are you talking about? It doesn't actually do strings, but that's it. Why is this good? It uses a large prime number to mod. That's the, the big thing, right? And then it uses each character in the string. Okay, you want to be able to if you have a, if you have the two strings hello and hello p or something, you don't want your hash functions to be like the same. You don't want your hash values to be the same because then what if you what if you only hash like letter words that start with a? It's going to not use like all the different letters. You always want to use all the letters in your string. Okay, so you can look at this online. If you ever need a good hash function for strings, this one's not bad. Okay. Bad hash functions. What if you just said, ah, here's my hash function. Add up all the ASCII values of each individual character in your string. It's, it's an easy one. It's fast. But first of all, most strings would only ever make, make it up to 500. So there's only 500 different possibilities. That's not so good. Okay, They're bunched up into 500 buckets. Anagrams of words, always going to collide. Because two words that have the same letters in them, if you're just adding up the characters of each letter to make your hash function, they're always going to collide. They're always going to be the same. That's not so good. All right? And this one's not too bad, but the hash is proportional to the string length. If you have longer strings, you'll do that. Right? What about uh, the first three letters in a word? Lots of words have prefixes. This is actually why tries work so well, right? Because words have, lots of words have prefixes. Right? Okay, so if we ended up modding by that, that number, you end up, if you ended up modding by, 100, by 127, you'd end up getting uh, 0 for all your buckets. So anyway, look at this in here. The, the bottom line is there are various good functions and bad functions for, hash, for hashing. Okay, so you just have to be a little careful on that. All right, all right. we're going to do some more things here later today. Um, remember that, uh, do you remember the hash? Uh, the hash code I gave you for uh, that I said, don't worry about this now, but it was the actual C++ code for the hashing hash tables. There are two letter words. I actually wrote that again in some other language. <coughs> this is a programming language called lolcat. <coughs> it's an actual programming language. At the end, you say, OK, thanks, bye. <laughs> kind of fun, right? I has a word dictionary. Is it's kind of interesting. Anyway, you can go look that that up. There's a there's like a an interpreter for this language too, so you can actually do it, use it. I've never seen a real program written in it, but who knows? All right. Okay, so let's go on to some other hashing things. Okay, this is actually today. Uh, for in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna well briefly go over the 
the Unix tip of the day. We're going to talk more about collision, more about load factor, perfect hash function, which I already mentioned. Then we're going to go into this really interesting topic, which doesn't have that much to do with data structures, but it's an interesting topic, and it has a lot to do with hashing. So I think you guys will like it. Um, most of my time spent in the Navy was as a cryptologist. So I like to think that I know something about cryptographic hashing, although I pushed a lot of paper around while the people that it worked for me did the fun stuff, which is always you know, eh, that's the way it goes. And then we're going to talk about whether hash functions should be slow or not. There might be a time where that's the case. Okay? All right, quick little Unix tip of the day. Piping. You guys have seen uh, the angle brackets before to pipe in to get like uh, data into your program and data out of your program, like into files. Piping is using this pipe character. It's actually like shift backslash or whatever. And what it is, this is actually one of the killer functions of Unix. Like one of the reasons Unix took off was because they had this idea that you could use this pipe character to make tiny little programs. You guys all know Bruce Molay, right? He loves tiny programs. And he, that's, he's the one who came up with the idea that you can't make your functions longer than 30 lines or whatever it is, or 40, whatever it is. He said, no, you don't need to. Your functions should never be that long, because you should be able to make things nice and modular. This is the big idea in Unix. Modularity means that each program can do like one thing and one thing well. Okay? So there's a program called cut, which pieces your string into a bunch of different strings. But that's all it does. It cuts strings up. That's all it does. It doesn't do all sorts of other stuff. You can't find and cut. Said, we talked about, does a lot of things, but it really is about searching. Okay? So, but what you can do is you can use this pipe character to stream programs through one another. The output of one program goes into the input of another program. The output of one goes into the input of the other one. And what happens is uh, they actually, it's actually better than just one program, then another program, then another program. It does them in parallel. Like the output of this program starts and it does something. And then the next program gets some of the data. And while this one's still doing the, first, the next part of its original data, the second program starts working on the first input. And the third program starts working on it. They all go at the same time. So it's actually really fast. <coughs> okay? Let me show you what you can do. And I'll actually demonstrate this to you. If you list all files in your directory, if you do an ls-a1, okay, here's all the files in my directory. Notice it's got the dot and the dot dot up there. Those are actually files. One means the current directory, one means the previous directory. But what if I wanted to list these files without those two? What I could do is I could use the pipe character and I could say there's a tail function which says, oops, there's a tail function which says uh, just give me the last bits of your program. So I could do pipe through tail dash n plus 3 is how you actually do it. And what it does is it says, just start on line 3 and give me all the output. And then notice, I start here, and then those two other files are gone, which is kind of nice. And I've just piped, them, piped the output of one through the output of the other. Okay? You can actually, actually keep piping these things whoops, forever and ever. <laughs> right? You can keep doing it. What if I wanted to get a word count of how many words there are in my, in my list, of, in, my, in my directory here? You can actually do ls-a1, pipe through tail, pipe through this thing called word count, which is another program that does one thing. It counts words, well, and lines and characters. And that will give you the number of lines in it, which happens to be nine. Okay? So it's actually kind of cool, this piping idea. You will learn more about that when you like, do more Unix things. But it makes things really like, nice to do. Okay? All right, that's enough for the Unix tip of the day. We already started here. Okay, back to hashing from, for a while. Remember this? One, deal, one way we deal with collisions were these linked lists. And I had to compress this to fit up here. Remember how we did this with linked lists, right? We now have go to a bucket. If there's stuff already there, you're going to start creating a linked list, or you're going to add on to the linked list that's there so that you can end up, um, so you can end up storing all the data that you want to. This isn't necessarily the best way to build a hash function, or a hash table, rather. Okay? Remember, it's called chaining. And what you do is you, you have to add onto these linked lists. And I don't really like linked lists. And you, know, you probably shouldn't love them either. It is one way to do this. And it is reasonable. But it's not necessarily the best way to do this. There are other ways to deal with collisions. Okay. Let's see. What else do we have to do? 
we have to add this other structure, the linked list. Let's make it so that we can deal with collisions without adding anything else. Okay. Alternatives to chaining, otherwise known as open addressing for some reason. <laughs> okay. Let's say that you have a you hash something. And it's supposed to go in here. Okay? It's supposed to go right here. And normal, like if we did chaining, we would have a linked list that says it's going to go, this linked list is going to go down like this. But there are empty spots in our hash table. We could put something here, and we could put something here, and we could put something here. Let's come up with a way to make it so that if we try to put something here, we end up putting it somewhere in an empty space instead of something that's filled. That's the idea of this open addressing scheme. Okay? If you try to do it there, it's filled. What if you just go to the next one and see if it's empty? This one happens to be filled, but then what if you go to the next one and see if it's empty? Can't you put it right here? If this one's filled and it's supposed to go there, it hashes to this bucket, and then you, you check this bucket and it's filled, just go to the next bucket and say, hey, are you filled? Yeah, I'm filled. Go to the next bucket. Hey, are you filled? Nope, I'm not filled. I'm going to put this here. Okay? This is called a linear. It's called a linear probe is what you're doing. Okay? You're basically checking where the bucket is and then checking if it's filled. Let's say that instead of trying to go here, the hash table put it here. Well, we would then check the next one and put it right there. Okay, it's called a linear probe because you are walking down the list of, open, of spaces until you find an open one. Okay? What might be the problem with that? Yeah? You're going to put it in a bucket that might be needed later on by somebody else. That's true. But then we could get around that by if something else is going to go here and it's filled now, try to put it here, try to put it, you know what I mean? So that, but that is a concern. Okay, what's another one? Yeah? If things are filled in an order, you're going to have to go really far. OK, I'm thinking of kind of an, a, another like, well, issue. It's, it's kind of hard to figure out to access the data if, you, if it's not in the original. Yeah, that's the big one. The other ones are great ideas. That's actually perfect, right? If you're trying, if your bucket is, if your hash code is supposed to go here, if your value is supposed to go there, and it's not there, you're in trouble, right? You can't look down some list. You've got to go find it. Right? So then there's a matter of finding it. So those, th there is a, a downside to this. But we can, we can figure that out. Here's how you go and find it. Right? You say, OK, I'm going to check here. And I check and see, is my key the one that I'm looking for? Remember, we're storing both the keys and the values. So you go to the original bucket and you say, are you the one I'm looking for? No. You go to the next bucket, are you the one I'm looking for? No. You go to the third bucket and you go, are you the one I'm looking for? Yep, you're the one I'm looking for. You can return that value. Okay, so it is possible to do this. Yeah, question. How do you know when to terminate that? Uh, how do you know when to terminate that? Good, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I was thinking you could go until you find empty buckets, but that won't work because if you take a <coughs> key out of the table, yeah. like leave an empty space before a, like before a move. Ah, we've got to talk about removes. Without removes, though, you do exactly that. You just go until you find a space. What if, what if you do this? What, was, what if this was the whole table and I tried to put something here? Where would I next try to put it? I would wrap around, right? It's a circular sort of idea, just like circular arrays. So if, it's, if this is filled, you go here and go, that's filled, that's filled, that's filled, put it there. So you could do that. You do have to make sure that you've got empty spaces in your, in your thing, right? If, you're, if your load factor was 1, you'd never find one and you'd go forever. <laughs> and it would create an infinite loop. So you've got to be really careful there. But your point is well taken that you have to deal with what happens if you remove something. We'll get to that. OK, we'll get to that. Linear probing is not the only way to do this. We could also do what's called quadratic probing, which, says, which, which addresses, um, Emily, were you the one who said that if, it, if they're all bunched up in one place? Yeah, if they're bunched up in one place, we can do a different way where instead of, instead of going to the next one, we go to the square of, the, of some index value. So then you'd go 0, you'd go 0, and then you'd go 1, and then you'd go 4, because 2 squared is 4. Then you'd go to 9, then you'd jump to 16, and you'd, you'd jump, 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 so that anything that's bunched together doesn't matter anymore. Okay? You can run into some problems with that, that sometimes no buckets ever get filled. 
but you have to be a little careful with that. But otherwise, this is a, a slightly better way because you aren't worrying about things being right next to each other. How does that actually work here? Well, you check one, and then you check this one. You go 0, 1, and then this one. So if these ones had been filled, you would have jumped over them, which is fine. Okay. If you have groupings of hashes, quadratic programming is good. There are some other ones, of course. Once, once you deal with this idea of, oh, I just have to find a new bucket, there's lots of different ones. You can do this thing called double hashing, which says, hey, if your original bucket is filled, if your original bucket is filled, apply another hash code and go to that bucket. Right? So you have another hash code that you can do this with. Okay? So you apply to the, nec the next bucket, and then you, you check. And you can do basically the same thing. You're going to do plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, and then you're going you're gonna, to uh, do these double hashes. You just have another backup hash function in case you need it. Okay? It adds a little bit of time to computing the hash, or figure out where in the bucket it goes, but it's actually not too bad overall. Okay? All right. In double hashing, the second hash function is the one that's multiplied by the number of times you've attempted the hash. So it still jumps, from, but it might jump randomly. It might, might not jump from one place to the next. It'll jump randomly around your, uh, your uh, buckets, which is kind of what we want. Right? We want a nice random uh, uh, distribution. So we'll get that from this. Okay. All right. So. If the table becomes full, we talked about this, right? You could fail to terminate, because if it's full, you'll never, get, you'll never find an empty bucket. That would be bad. So you've got to keep an eye on your load factor. Okay? And remember, the load factor is just the number of keys divided by the number of buckets. We said that we'd keep it around 0 0.8, 0 0.7, something like that. You have to keep it less than 1. It def there definitely has to be some empty spots. Otherwise, you will you will uh, crash your program or stall it forever or whatever. Okay. What do we do if our load factor gets too big? What do we do? What did we do when we had our array get too big? Doubled it in size. OK, so we just, we just made it bigger, right? We made our whole array twice as big, right? Can we do that with hash tables? Nathan? Then if you try to do that, any ones that end up looping around the edge would be impossible. So it's back to my question. Yeah, if you, you, can, you can do this, but you've got to be really clever about it. right? You can't create a new dynamic array. OK, I'm going to go back so you can think about this for a second. Really fast readers would have gotten that. You can't just go back because you can't. Remember, if something hashes to, here's your array. OK, 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's say that was your original array. And you had some value that the hash code before modding was, say, 7. OK, if the hash code before modding was 7, and then you did mod the table size, which is 4, where does that one end up? At position 3. So let's say it would end up being 7 would be at position 3 there. OK, if it ends up there, and then you double the table size, There, I think that's double the table size. OK, now where does 7 actually hash to? 5, 6, 7. Oops, I didn't. Oh, no, I did. There we go. If, now where does 7 mod 8 hash to? 7. So now, if we're looking for it, we're going to look over here, and we're going to not find it. OK, so you can't just double the size of the array, copy all the elements over, and be good to go. You will lose all your hashes all the ones that wrap around anyway, you'll lose them. Not to mention the fact that if you've applied some collision scheme, things get all wacky. Okay? So you're going to be in trouble with that. All right, what do we do? Rehash everything. So what you do is you go through all your, ha your hash table, and you say, fine, I'm going to take a little longer to do this, but I'm going to rehash all of my keys. Okay. There is another way to do this called consistent hashing, but it's really tricky to do. I don't even know how I would come up with a consistent hashing thing. It basically says, no matter what, we're going to end up, hashes are going to end up in the same place each time. Um, it's, it's not easy to do, and I don't think it's, it's very generic. So you could do that. But basically, rehash all the keys into your new array. So instead of copying them all, just rehash them and apply the same 
collision strategy too, right? So you can't just rehash them because then there'll be collisions. So you still have to apply the same collision strategy. Okay, so regard, so you have to uh, have to do that when we're doing when we're doing that. Okay. We'll get into it. We'll, we'll practice that. We'll practice that. Uh, if not today, then next time. What happens if we try to remove an element? This is the question that came up earlier. What happens if you try to remove an element from an open hashing scheme? Right? If you, let's say we're trying to uh, find key 3, and key 3 maps to where it, here, and we ended up putting it here, right? Well, if we delete this, we're going to go here and say, are you, uh, are, are you the key? No, I'm, it's empty. So guess what? You stop searching. By the way, I guess we didn't really talk about that. In open addressing, if you're looking for a particular key, OK, let's say that we have, um, I don't know, 6 and 2, and we map 4, and 4 is supposed to go into this position. How do we find if 4 is already there? Like, let's say we're looking for 4. We go here and we check, is 6 equal to 4? No. We go to the next one if we're doing linear probing. We go to the next one, we say, is 2 equal to 4? No. We go to the next one, we say, oh, it's empty. 4 must not be in the table. Doesn't that make sense how we're going to do that? If you're allowed to delete things, you're in trouble. Because you'll end up with an empty space and maybe miss something. Let's say 4 happened to be over here, and, we, and, and before it was like 6, 2, 9, 4. If you're looking for 4, you go here, not there. You go there, not there. You go there, not there. You go there, hey, there it is. But then you come along and you delete this one, and you look for 4. You go here, not there. You go here, not there. You go here, it's empty. 4 is not in the table. So that's a problem. right? How are we going to mitigate that? What do you think? Yeah? Did you just mark it as deleted but full? And then your search function will still think it's full. But like if, you want, if there's something new that hashes to it, you can just replace it. So I would mark it as, so you're saying mark it as deleted but full? How about deleted but empty? Right? It has to be full for the search element. Oh, I see what you mean. Deleted, but deleted meaning you can replace it. Yeah, replace yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re deleted meaning you replace it. That's exactly right. Okay, so that's actually a good way to do it. Did you have a comment or are you going to say the same thing? <coughs> same thing? Good. Okay, so, so yeah, so you can't do this, right? So what you can do is you can say, you can say, mark it as deleted and then keep searching, right? And then you could actually, uh, you could actually back populate it the next time you come through. Okay, so you have to be a little careful with that. Yeah? Could you track more data in the array? So say you put four and it should be hashed index two instead of just five. So in index two you would track where you put the extra, like where four went. I think the problem with doing that is if you try to track where things go, you'll end up with linear behavior because you have to do that for everything and what do you end up doing? You know, it's, it's, you'll, you'll probably end up going down a path that ends up with linear behavior. You have to be a little careful with that sort of thing. It might work, but it might not be as efficient as you think if you're trying to keep more information around. The idea of this is keep as little information as you can because it takes more time to keep more information. But, but yeah. OK, so we could do that. We could definitely delete it. And then the next time an element's defined that could go into the deleted spot, just move it into that spot. Or, well, the next time it's found that it could go in there, you could do that. Or the next time you actually implement it, you could have it go in there. OK, so um, lots of different ways. Uh, there's different ways of doing that. But you can't just remove it. Otherwise, you will lose track of some other keys. OK? All right. Is there a perfect hash function? Well, we did talk about some, a perfect hash function. That hash function we came up with for uh, the two-letter words is a perfect hash function because it never collides. Okay? If you know the keys ahead of time, you can actually come up with a perfect hash function for those keys. And that kind of makes sense. It basically says, hey, here's a formula based on the keys that are going to come in here to make them go to the proper bucket. Okay? It's not that easy to do, all right? But we, in, except in trivial cases, we did it pretty trivially with the two letter words. But if you know the keys ahead of time, you can do this. There's whole papers written about this. Go look up this paper, and you can talk, it talks about how these different methods for creating these perfect hashes. Okay? If you really don't want to deal with collisions, find a perfect hash. If you don't know what keys you're going to put in there to begin with, you're done. You can't figure out a perfect hash. Okay? Not going to be possible. All right? If you happen to find a perfect hash that happens to go into n keys for n buckets, 
It's called a minimal perfect hash function. Even harder to do. <laughs> but again, you can go look up papers on how to do it, and they'll tell you, hey, here's the way we did it. But people are like getting published in journals and conferences and things because they come up with these things. So not trivial to do. A lot of the stuff we've talked about is somewhat trivial, but this, not trivial to do. Okay, go look up those functions if you want. All right, let's talk a little bit about this other idea of hashing. Remember, hashing says take a number, come up with another number. Right? Cryptographic hash functions is actually kind of cool because you use it every single time you buy something on Amazon.com. Okay? Every time you type in your password on the server, you're using a cryptographic hash function. And what it means is that you're trying to create a, a hash that nobody else can figure out, basically. Okay? And I'll, I'll show you what this means in a second. Does anyone know what this hashes to, or hashes a hash from. By the way, that's a really long number. That's like a 64-bit number. Okay, It's a really long number. And actually, it might, not, it might even be more than 64-bit. It might be, uh, might be 128. I, I don't think it quite fits on there. If it, did. it might be 128 bits, or it might be 256, now that I think about it. 256 bits. In other words, this is a really long number. Now, it's got letters in there. Those are just hexadecimal letters. They're base 16 letters or numbers, I should say, base 16. Anyone know what this hash is to? Of course you don't. Because it's a, hash, it's a cryptographic hash code, and you can't, you can't just know what it has. I should say hash is from, what it hashes from. Turns out it hashes from struggle bus, which is what this thing was, which is what you have to, would have to do to figure out this. This is a struggle bus, by the way. Okay. Actually, before the wheels were moving, there we go. The only animation we've had in this class is like on the slides right there. Cryptographic hash function does the following. Okay, a cryptographic hash function takes an arbitrary block of data, some data, your password, right, your credit card number, whatever, some data, and it maps it to a fixed length string that can, that, such that any change to the data, in other words, any change to your original data gives you a completely different string. Okay? We call that hash a message. Okay? By the way, we're not talking about hash tables anymore. We're talking about hash functions in general that actually produce these giant long numbers here. And by the way, you can't see this. on It's hard to see on the board. But um, if you look on the slides, this is how to create this big long number from Strugglebus using Python. Okay? You can actually do that. All right? what, what, we, what we mean by, um, well, I'll show you what we mean by, by uh, arbitrary block of data to a fixed length string, the change of data. I'll show you what that means in a second. When we talk about cryptographic hashing, there are four main things. And remember, we're talking digital security here. Okay? And by the way, this is a good plug for the digital security class taught by Professor Chow. It's, um, uh, it's taught actually next semester. Uh, it might have a prerequisite of some class you haven't taken yet, but I'm not sure. Uh, but you should take it at some point because it's a really good class. He also calls it Defense of the Dark Arts. Which is kind of cool. Um, so here's what the properties of good cryptographic hash functions are. OK, you ready for this? It is easy to compute the hash value. Generally, we want these hash codes to be able to be created very fast. OK? It shouldn't take you all day to come up with this, this ma uh, message. Or I'm sorry, the, sorry I, I said this wrong a minute ago. The data is the message. The message is struggle bus. The hash, or another thing we call it, the digest, is the actual result we get. Okay, the message versus the digest. It should not take a long time to go from message to digest. Okay, because we want to be able to do these things quickly. Because if you're encrypting things, you want to do them quickly. It should be infeasible to generate a message that has a given hash. In other words, if I gave you this big long number. You should not be able to say, calculate, calculate, calculate. You get that number from struggle bus. Okay? It should be very, very hard to do that. Okay? In fact, it's, it's very hard to do that. Okay? And that's the thing. That's one thing. We'll go over some more examples of this in a minute. It should also be infeasible to modify a message without changing the hash. Okay? In other words, 
If you said struggle bus, I, I'll, I'll give you an example in a later, and I'll show it to you next slide. If, you, if I give you the message struggle bus, uh, it sh you, you should not be able to change one letter in that and get the same hash value out of it. That would be bad. Okay? Here's an, a better example. Let's say, that, uh, let's say that Zach and I both have a password, or any other, Zach, any other Zachs. Let's say Zachs, let's say all the Zachs in here decided to have the password be Zach something. Not a good password, by the way. But let's say you had the password Zach something, and that something was like, like you just said, um, I don't know, the, the Zach and the name of your first pet, right? You don't want the two hashes to be similar to each other, okay? You don't want Zach Fido to be, have a similar hash to Zach Florentine pet name was Florentine. You don't want those two to have the same thing because you don't want somebody to, let's say that I knew, I knew one Zach's password and it was Zach something. And another Zach's password, uh, I said, well, maybe it's Zach something as well. I don't want to be able to figure out that those two passwords are the same. Better example. Let's talk about password hashing for a second. OK. What was your first pet's name? Daisy. Daisy. OK. We'll use the first letter. Zach D. That's, that's your password. Terrible password, by the way. But let's say that was your password. OK? That password is going to be hashed into some crazy string of numbers. 0, 5, D, E, 4, 3. OK? Zach, what was your first pet's name? Fit. That was, a, that was the name? Nice. OK. <laughs> Zach F. OK. Your password should be hashed into something else. We don't want it to be hashed into 05DF43, or bad example because it's F, but let's say it's like A43. OK? Because here's what the people in the, uh, in the IT department do. They store these things for you. Okay? Has anybody lost their password on the, or forgotten their password on the server at all? Okay, you have to go to a special web page. You have to make up a new password, right? If you tried to say, you know what, I really liked my old password, even though I don't remember what it was, right? And you, you can't go down to the tech people and say, could you guys give me my password back? Okay? Just, just tell it to me so then I'll know it, so I don't need to change it. It's impossible for them to do that. Like they can't do it and they have no way of doing that. Okay? They don't know, they have no way of getting your password back. Question. If you have the hashing function, can't you just work? You can't work it backwards. There's no backwards function. It's what's what we call a one-way function. So you can you you there are ways to do we will talk a little bit later, probably on Monday if not today, about various ways of of breaking people's passwords, but this is not how it works. Look in the system, find the password, and now you have the password. Because your passwords are not stored. Guess what? For Zach Daisy over here, the password that's stored, what's stored for him is this. That's what's stored for this Zach. For the other Zach, this is what's stored, right? Now, if let's say you're really sneaky and you broke into the school's computers and you got the like access into the school's computers and you were able to steal this data, you don't want to go, oh, Zach's Daisy's password is, uh, is this. There's another password that looks pretty similar, so I think the other Zach's password is Zach with an F or something. You don't want to be able to do that. What you want is for Zach Fish's password to be something completely different. B nine four A A two. You want one letter change in your message to go to a completely different hash. This is so that if you steal the passwords, one reason. So if you steal the passwords, you can't go backwards and you can't compare the end up the hashes. Yeah. They would show the same password. If you did change to take the same password, they would go to the same hash because pa hashes are deterministic. So yes, if you happen to have both have named your first, was it a fish? Yeah. OK. Whew. All right. If you both named your first dog fish, right? 
or whatever, then yes, they would both go to the same hash. And then you would be able to tell they're the same password. You wouldn't be able to go backwards and find them, but you'd be able to do that. Yeah? Uh, so you said that the hashes kind of like reverse hash. So how do those functions work on where you forget your password and you do like password retrieval? Yeah, password retrieval, they do keep your password, which is terrible. You should never go to a website that does that. Or if they send you a password, you should send them an email and say, you guys really need to help like, update your security, because that's bad. Right? You don't want to do that. Because you don't want people to know your passwords, or you don't want to be able to get them from that. So this is the way passwords, in general, work. Okay? All right, so what else do we have here? Infeasible to modify a message without changing the hash. Right? So if we change Zach D to Zach F, we want a completely different hash. Right? And it's also infeasible to find two different messages with the same hash. Now you will eventually get you will eventually get collisions, but you want them to be very hard to get. So if I pick Zach D, it should go to this one. And if I pick uh, Barnaby Jones as my password, it should go to something completely different. They both should not go to the same value. Okay? Question then question. Yeah. That's exactly what it's doing, and thank you for bringing that up. When you type in your password, how does the computer know? That's exactly what it does. The comp you type in your password, and then the system, actually what's interesting is, um, I believe it doesn't actually get in, well it goes into memory very briefly. But basically your password gets turned into a hash, and then it compares hashes, and they say, oh okay, Zach D hash is this, that those two hashes are the same, therefore it's the right password. It doesn't. It never can go backwards from this to the password. Good point, Kate. You had a question. Um, when, when people, when you like forget your password in the email, you have like a random string of digits and letters. Is that a password? Or do you have like uh, no. When they, when they, sometimes they will do that too. They'll say, "Here's your new password." It's also insecure because somebody else could grab that and like log in with you. But if they email you a new one, that's just another. That's just a, another password that then gets hashed into something else. So it will eventually get hashed. Sorry, you had a question first. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. So, Yeah. Like it's not exactly running the hash code backwards, it's, but it's knowing the formula of the hash code. Yeah, you can know the formula of the hash code, but going backwards is really hard. Okay. Let me just give you a, let me just give you an example here. Okay, let's say that um, let's say that your hash code was mod four. I don't know, whatever, right? Okay, uh, let's say that we you type in eight, right? Eight mod four gives you what? Gives you zero, right? Okay, how what did I start with? Something mod 4. What did I start with? I could have started with 0. I could have started with 4. I could have started with 8. I could have started with 16. I could have started with 12, right? Anything divided by 4 that gives 0. So that's one way of like having a one-way function. You, don't, you can know how to get there, but you have no idea where you came from, right? And it's obviously much more subtle than this, but that's the way it generally works, right? Which is kind of cool. Other questions? Yeah, you had one and then, yep. Yeah, it does have to be stored somewhere, but it, but it's not stored like after you log in, it's gone. They it's literally erase it from memory, so it's not they don't keep it anywhere in a log or anything. It's just it's gone there. So then the next time you log in, if somebody else is trying to log in as you, it's not stored anywhere on the system. One sec. Okay. So it compares the hash password. Yeah, it compares the digests. Yes. No, because the only way the only way it lets you in is if it takes your password and turns it into the digest. Okay. Right? It won't let you in otherwise. Well, if you could bypass that step, you wouldn't need a password at all, probably. <laughs> right? But yeah, yeah, you're right. You can't do that though. Good question. Okay, lots of questions, which is great. Yeah. Um, is, do most companies use one hash function, like a default, or does each company have its own? Most companies use a hash function that's publicly available. Right? Why would they make a hash function publicly available? Any ideas? Yeah. Well, it's it it makes it a really good one because you and me and everybody else who's really smart can go and check it and try to break it. And if you can't break it, guess what? If smart people can't break it, the bad guys probably can't break it. The NSA doesn't want you to believe that, but right. But the but the idea is make your you don't want your hash function to be private to you so that no one else can check it because you might not be as smart as all those other people who might check it. That's a good point. Yeah. Oh, two. Sorry. Go ahead, and then, then. Yeah. 
Yeah, unfortunately, credit cards are generally kept because they need to send it to the credit card agency. Right? So in other words, you can't just keep the hash of your credit card because what's the point of keeping it, right? There's no way to go back. So when, when, when companies keep your credit card so that you don't have to type it the next time, they have to actually encrypt it such that they can get back your credit card. So it's slightly less secure in that way. Yeah. Question. <coughs> yeah, how, many, uh, how come so many accounts get hacked? We'll talk about that in a little bit. There is a way to go backwards on these to an extent. You'll see what I mean in a, minute, in a few minutes. Anybody else? Yeah. If everybody you well well right if everybody if you couldn't have your you can't have your passwords stolen you could have your hash function stolen now here's an issue right if you get the hash codes and if you are able to go back to the the original password anywhere you used that password that happens to use the same hash function you could use but they, they, there's studies that are done on stupid passwords and people like literally use password as their password like way more often than you'd think right. And uh, you know it's 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 kind of don't you know you, you do want to use different passwords for different different logins just in case there is a breach and somebody's able to get your you know if if it's it's not so good okay somebody else had a question anybody else okay I'm glad there's lots of questions we'll we'll be we'll do more of this stuff next week quickly we already talked about this it's easy to compute the hash value if you want to compute a lot of messages you better be able to do it fast check that's number one number two. If you, it is infeasible to generate a message that has a given hash. That's the point of password hashing. Given this, you do not want to get that or any password that makes that. By the way, if you do happen to have two passwords that hash to the same value, you can use either one to log in, right? Because they both hash to the same value, which is, which is hard. But you don't want to do that. You want your password hashes to be as unique as possible. Okay, cryptographic hashes should be this one way. You can't go backwards. Okay, and uh, this is another interesting one. Someone could trick you into thinking they wrote a particular message if you have the hash. So, in other words, um, or if I guess if they, if if you have the hash, then we'll, we'll talk. We'll we'll see the example in a few minutes. But this is kind of cool how you can actually prove that someone else wrote something given this idea that there are hashing that that's hard to go backwards. I'll show you that in a minute. OK, uh, let's see. The third one was, it's infeasible to modify message. This is the one I was talking about earlier. Struggle bus maps to this. Struggle bub, change one letter, maps to something completely different. OK, that's good. That's a very good thing. You do not want struggle bus and struggle bub to go to very similar, because then you'd be able to say, hey, they both are similar messages. Okay, so you don't want that. Okay. It's infeasible to find two messages with the same hash. In other words, you want to have very, very few collisions. Okay, we already saw that it's going to be impossible to have no collisions, but having few collisions is unlikely given the way we build these functions. Okay, so that's interesting. All right, let's look at some examples. Turns out in cryptology, we always use the, the idea of two people named Alice and Bob. Okay? Alice in Wonderland, Bob, Sideshow Bob. <laughs> Not necessarily, but Alice and Bob, they both, by the way, they could both be good and bad, and whatever. We'll see. This is, the, this is the, the idea that you can prove, using a hash code, you can prove that you did something. Like, and this is, by the way, how people who do patents can, can prove that they did something on a certain day and so forth. Let's say that Alice claims to Bob that she solved some hard math problem. Okay, she says, I've got this problem. It's really hard, but I've solved it. Right? And she says, and Bob says, hey, I want to try that math problem. Okay? And she wants to make sure that Alice is telling the truth. What Alice can do is she can write down the solution. Okay? And she can give the hash to Bob. And she can say, here's my solution. But it's in hash form. In other words, it looks like that. Okay, it doesn't mean anything to Bob yet. Okay. When Bob solves the problem, Alice can then say, here's my original solution. Let Bob hash her solution and find out that it goes to that, that value. 
And then he can say, oh, yeah, you really did create this beforehand. OK? She can say, look, I've got it here. Here's the answer. And then uh, Bob can say, OK, well, after I solve it, check to see that she solved it by hashing her original and saying, here's the result. And nobody else could have come up with that result. And there's no other way to come up with that result. So therefore, um, her solution is, was done by her. Okay, it's an interesting thing. This, this also comes up in, you guys have heard of digital signatures before? Basically the same idea. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit, uh, a little later. We already talked about this, password verification. Do not store your password in clear text. Okay? If a system only stores the hashes, then you do not automatically reveal your password. Okay? And you just match the hash of the password to the stored hash. Okay? You can't go retrieve them because nobody's stored your password anywhere. That's the beauty of it. Okay? All right. Is there any case where hashing should be slow? What do you think? Wouldn't you, if it's something that's like, let's say like a password, you don't want somebody to be able to attempt it many, many times to figure it out? Yeah, this is exactly right. You don't want somebody to be able to attempt your password many times. There's a real good reason why uh, when you log in three times, it says stop log, it kicks you off, right? If you goof, if you log in three times with your password, the wrong password, it'll just say you got to try it again, right? In fact, if you do that and then immediately log back in and do it again, eventually it will say, I'm sorry, you can't log in for an hour. Right? It's because you don't want people to be able to just test, 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 right? Test one password after the other. So we can actually make this down to the level of the hashing itself and say that um, we can actually make the hashes themselves slow. But here's the setup for this. If Bob store, steals a set of usernames and hashes, remember, the, the hashes are stored on the computer. The homework server stores the hashes, and it stores your username, because it's got to know where to go to look for your hash. By the way, it probably uses a hash table, but not with the hashes of the values now. Okay? And what it does is it has your username and hashes. What Bob can do is he can create a table of known password hashes, and he can, at his leisure, have his computer go from password to hash. And then how does he figure out if you, what your password is? It's, kind of, it's, called, it's brute force, but what he does is he says, OK, I've got this list of hashes. Does anybody else have this hash? Right? Because he's got all the hashes. And then he goes to the hash and he says, oh, I know, now know the hash based on this password that I figured out by running this, all this test and doing it. So what does this mean for you? It means don't use password as your password. Right? It means don't use I love my cat as your password. Well, that's not a terrible one, but you know. Don't use like your first name or whatever for your password because what they will do is they will get they will take the hash function and do a really super fast computer and calculate all the hashes and they because they're calculating all the hashes they have the originals they don't throw the originals away they say what does password hash to and then they go and look if anybody has that hash then they know your password's password right so that's bad okay this is called a rainbow table as it turns out. Okay? And Bob can do this. You want to make it so that Bob has to take a long time to create all these hashes. In other words, you want to make it so that Bob, it takes like a second to create one hash. Oh, that would be forever for a computer. Right? If you can make your computer take, be really uh, slow to do the algorithm, then it can take forever to come up with this table of, of password hashes. Okay? And that's, that's, so, that's not good. Okay? Increasing the time is called key stretching. In other words, you type in your password, it says, OK, I'll start calculating your hash. And then it takes time, and it does lots and lots of stuff to do that. Problem with that is, is that computers are getting faster and faster. So last year's slow hash function is this year's fast hash function. Right? So you've got these things that are called, uh, you've got like GPUs, and what it is is, the faster your, your computer is, the more passwords you can do. Another way to get around this is to say, hey, it's gonna, it, to do your password takes up lots of memory. Like whatever it is, however you're doing this, takes up lots of memory. And then you can, memory actually grows slower than speed in terms of more, like more computers. Okay, so that is actually another way to do this. Another way to get better, hash, uh, better 
passwords. So there is a time where, pass, pass, where hashing passwords can, should be slow. And this is where that helps. Okay? Another way to, uh, to combat this rainbow, solution, rainbow uh, table is very interesting. It's called salting your password. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. Salting your password is kind of cool. What it means is, let's say that Zach D here has his password, and his password is Zach D. And let's say, let's, say that, let's say that he wasn't so smart about it. Right? Let's say that you made your password password. Okay? If your password was password, these rainbow tables will very quickly figure this out because lots of people use passwords, so it will know the hash. What you do is you say, well, that, that password came from Zach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say password Zach is now your password. And you only type the first part, and the computer tags on the second part. Okay? And what it does is now, let's say that Chris has the say, I use the word password, and Zach uses the word password. Well, Zach's password is actually password Zach. My password is password Chris. Right? And guess what? Those hash to different values now. Okay? So this actually means that these rainbow tables are much less effective because now for every password, you have to have a password plus a username. And that actually makes it so it's much, much harder to, to foil the system this way. Okay? So it's actually kind of, it's pretty cool, but it's harder to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Hash functions get faster because computers are faster, yeah. Yeah, what, what they end up doing, I don't know if you've ever gotten this message I have for various websites, right? But it's, it's an email that says, um, we're kind of sorry that, that we, like, we had a security breach and now all your hashes were stolen. They might not say that, but they might say, you know, your data about you is stolen. You need to reset your password. And then everybody has to reset their password. And so the next time you log in, what they would do is they would let you log in like one more time and then you'd have to reset it. So that's, that's the way they would get about, around it. Yeah. Good. OK. Let's keep going here for a couple more things. File verification. This is actually really neat. Sometimes you might have seen this or you might have ignored it if you did see it, but you can go to a, uh, a website and download, say, Firefox. Right? If you want to download Firefox, if you go to the, like, let's say you just type download Firefox into Google. And instead of clicking on the top link, which would be the smart one, you click like seven links down. Right? And it still says download Firefox. Yeah, I'll just click on this one. You click on the seven. And it goes to, it goes to uh, Bob's website and says, download Firefox from my website. Right? And you download it, and then you install it. And then the next day, your entire computer's erased because Bob, in the meantime, logged onto your computer and did it because he gave you a bad version of Firefox. He gave you a Firefox that has a, a virus in it that sends him all your password data. Right? So uh, because what you do is you clicked on that Firefox, and he just said, hey, this is Firefox, and, but it had a virus in it. Right? What Mozilla does, they're the ones who make Firefox, they publish a hash of their program. And they say, here's the hash of the program. If you want to guarantee that your program is really Firefox with no viruses, run your own hash function that we tell you which one it is. It's called the MD5. Run MD5 on Firefox the, when you download it, before you install it, and check and see if it's this big long string. And if it's different, you shouldn't be downloading from Bob's special programs website. Right? You should go download it from us. So you can check that. And here's how you would actually do it. Go to this website. Hopefully it still works. It worked this way last semester. Download this file. Right? That's the actual, uh, that's the actual uh, release of Firefox. Go download the, the checksum. It's called the checksum. It's actually the, the hash or the digest from Firefox. Run the, run the MD5. It's easy to do. You do MD5 on the name of the file you just downloaded, and it should spit out the same number. And if it does, you go, this is a version from, Microsoft, or from Mozilla. I'm good to go. OK, so you can actually do these check file verification checks straight away. It's pretty cool. Okay. 
digital signatures. We can do the same thing with digital signatures, right? Well, it's kind of a little, a little bit different. One of the biggest advances in computer science, in, in cryptography in the last like 20 years, or 30 years, I guess, is this idea of public-private keys. Have you heard of those before? Yeah? You have, if you, if you are going to like Amazon, they will issue you, or your computer figures out, I guess your web browser figures it out, they give you two, pa they give you two uh, keys, right? They give you a public one and a private one. And your computer holds the private one, and nobody ever gets access to that. Anybody else in the world can have your public one. Okay? Using the combination of these two keys, you can actually trade information back and forth uh, securely. Okay? So it's actually really neat how it works. Let me see if I have got the details here. Okay, we've got two minutes. Alice has this private key. She gets to keep it. Nobody else gets to see it. What she does, and then, and then there's a public key, which is actually a derivative of it, but it's one of these one-way functions. So you can't go back from the public key to the private key. It's imp almost impossible to do that. Okay? And she hashes her message using the private key. Remember, Alice has her private key. And she wants to send a message to Bob and says, to say to Bob, hey, Bob, you're the best. And she doesn't want anybody else to, she wants Bob to know it came from her. Okay? She hashes that with her private key. Okay? She hashes it with her private key, and she gives that to Bob. And Bob takes the public key and does a function on it using the result and gets back the original message. The only way that message could be, go back to the original is if it came from Alice's private key. And Alice is the only one who has the private key, so therefore the message had to come from Alice. Okay? It's definitely more subtle, and we don't have like more than one minute to talk about it, but it's really kind of a cool way you can do this. This is how a digital signature works. You take your message, and or whatever it is, you apply your private key to that message and it becomes this hash. Somebody else with your public key can apply the public key to that message and they get back the original and they say it must have come from you because I know this is your public key. So it's actually really cool that you can do digital security this way. Okay? We'll maybe talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Okay? And that's how you actually get the result back. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour on cryptographic hashing. But if you have questions about that, put them on Piazza or ask me. All right, see you guys later. <laughs>